scream it from the mountains Go on and tell it to the masses That he is one Shout it Go on and scream it from the mountains I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every strong shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want Fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Your name is God. Your name is He. in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name of Jesus sing it again shout Jesus from the mountain Jesus in the streets. Jesus.
Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. One more time. Use us. We are here for you. We are available. Use us to reach the nations. Use us to reach those around us. Use us each day. People need to hear, Lord, of your wondrous grace. Everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. I want to release the children now to go on to Children's Church. Um, I want to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Edgar Galdamez, 
And Edgar and I have been talking quite a bit the last, last few weeks. And Edgar is the pastor of Hispanic Ministries at Canyon Hills over, um, is it Mill Creek or is it Bothell? It's in Bothell. Uh, if you're familiar with Canyon Hills, it's, it's a very large church over there. And um, he's just uh, been hired by that uh, probably eight, eight to ten months ago. So uh, um, I got to know Edgar, and he's going to preach our sermon today and um, also he's going to be with us in the combined service next week at 11 o'clock okay so uh, I'll be mentioning that at the end of our service once again but um, we want to we want to take our offering and as ushers come forward take an offering and as we take the offering we want to have direct your attentions forward uh, to a video go ahead Bill to be here with you and uh, share with you God's word. I'm looking forward to, um, especially, uh, I won't say much about myself because you'll hear a little bit next week. So if you want to know a little bit more about me, come next week. It'll be fun. Um, and uh, we'll be able to share together with our Hispanic church. Um, so I'm more than thrilled to be here next week as well. If you open your Bibles, we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, verses 32 and all the way to chapter, verse 42. If you have it open, we'll get to it in a few, in a few minutes. We'll read that text. Um, but as, as we saw that video, isn't it a beautiful video? Uh, we know there is a need for the gospel. And in fact, the Lord Jesus, before he ascended, you know the famous words, right? the Matthew 28, 19, and 20, where he says, Go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations, right? We all know that. We've heard it so many times. And he said that that's called the great mandate. He usually referred to that great mandate of the church to go and share the gospel with all nations. In fact, the word there for nations, ethnos, means all ethnic uh, groups, regardless of their language, their tongue, or even their ethnic background. And we've heard this before. You probably have heard that there, there are at least 3.6 billion people in the world, and now population-wise, you know we're around seven, almost eight billion right now, that do not know yet Jesus. They're unreached. Um, in fact, uh, most of them have never heard who Jesus is, which is astounding when you think about it. To have 3.6 billion people that haven't heard the gospel, it's incredible. And when we talk about this, most of the time we say it's, it's, called, it's in the area called a 1040 window. It's, it's an area geographically where most people live and approximately uh, most of them live there. However, our topic today is not yet, it's not about reaching the world over there in different countries, but it's reaching the nations here. 
which is very interesting. If you've never heard this before, it'll be something that you can perhaps think about and pray about. But there are 97 unreached people groups here in the United States. So think about that. That's a good number. There are a good number of people from those uh, nations that are unreached that have come here to America, and there are about 97 of those people's groups. In fact, it is estimated that by 2044, half of the population here in America will be a minority, which is very interesting, right? When we think about how, why is the United States growing so much? Well, by 2044, half of the population in the United States will be, I call a minority majority, meaning people from different countries, at least their background. And the largest and fastest groups right now are Hispanics and the Asian population. You got a Hispanic guy right here. <laughs> and you got another one over here that I just met today. Um, but they are the fastest growing, and so are Asians. Now, um, all these groups and subgroups, by and large, do not know Jesus, which is very interesting. In fact, I was one of those people, and you'll hear next week, that did not know Jesus but came here and came to know Jesus. The question that, that we, we need to come up with is, as we see this happening, we ask the question, why is this happening? Why are we seeing these demographic changes in our country? And I've, asked, I've often asked myself, is there something that God is trying to tell us? Right? We'll always think about that. Is God trying to tell us something? And so I came up with a couple of questions that I've thought myself. In fact, I've asked people these questions, and uh, I normally don't get uh, an answer, or I get, oh, interesting. So here's the question. What if God wants us to share the gospel with all immigrants and minorities coming to the United States? What if we, God wants us to do that, disciple them, train them, and send them out back to their country to reach the unreached? What if, or if we put it a different way, what if God has sent those nations to us because we failed to go so that we can share the gospel with them, disciple them, train them, and then send them out to complete the gospel mandate? And do we say, can we say, is this possible? Is it possible for us to do this? I believe so. In fact, it's already happening in some refugees that have been coming to America. Some of them are already doing this, are reaching the uh, refugees, sharing the gospel, and they're going back to their countries to share the gospel. So it is possible. This bring us, brings us to the text this morning in John chapter 4, verses 32 through 42. And if you can open your Bible, we'll, we'll read that. John chapter 4, verse, verses 32. It says this, but he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for the harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for the eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labor, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the Tat town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to, to stay with them. And he stayed there for uh, two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, if we look at this context, right, you've read this before probably, and it's the... Um, the story or, or encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman. And it's very interesting because when you read this, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And Jews were not allowed to go there. In fact, they would go a different route. It was a, a place that was forbidden to, for them to go. There was a cultural and religious boundary that they would not and couldn't cross. 
And yet it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Why? Because I believe that he was doing the will of God. And he broke that culture and religious boundary because he was bound to do the will of God. And so we can state this in a, a practical application for us. It is the will of God for us to reach those who are ethnically different than us. And it was here in this place in Samaria where Jesus talked to this Samaritan woman. And after she believed, she goes back to her town and tells all the other people, or the people in Samaria, who Jesus was. He tells them that he is the Messiah. And it is at this point that the disciples come back. And it's also very interesting that disciples, they all went to get food. All of them. And they left Jesus. That's hard to believe, right? So it was the will of God for him to have this encounter with this woman. And at this point, when she, he's done talking to the woman, the woman goes back to town. And we, we, Jesus is, uh, has the disciples come back. And at this point, they are asking him questions. He says these words that we just read about his, uh, the food. He says, to the, will, the will of God is for me to, to, to eat this food. And they're like wondering, what is he talking about? What, what is he talking about the food? I mean, does he not get something to eat? Does he get something to eat? What does he instruct them? As they come and they listen to him. This is what he says. He says, look at the fields. And that's what we want to see. What did he mean by that? What were the fields? He says, lift up your eyes. See that the fields are ready and white for the harvest. What are those fields? What was he looking at? Well, again, the woman goes back to Samaria she, and she tells me, and what, what, happens, what happens then? All these Samaritans are coming to see Jesus. And Jesus says, look. Look at the fields. They're white for the harvest. They were the Samaritans. He's looking at them. And they were the people that were closest to the Jews. If you know the geography, their Samaria was very close to them. They were the people that were, were close to them that were ignored, neglected, and rejected by them. And yet Jesus says they're ready to receive the news of the kingdom. And at this point, again, the woman had already gone back to tell the town, and now they're coming to see him. Now we've got to ask ourselves this question, where is our Samaria? Right? Our Samaria, where is it? Is in front of us. Whatever is in front of us around where we live, that's our Samaria. And that's the interesting thing, that we still have a Samaria that is ethnically different around our country. In fact, I've been seeing these patterns for a long time, and, and I thought I was the only guy thinking about this. But I wasn't. About a year ago, I came across a book by a guy who's a Hispanic too, Alejandro Mendez, and normally I don't quote a lot of from books, but it, I, I thought he said really some really good things that I actually would, would I prefer to say myself. But the book is called Embracing the New Samaria. And when I read it, it confirmed a lot of what's going on as far as the demographic changes here in the United States. And he, he calls this new Samaria, Samarica. And he says that who are those Sam America or New Samaria? He says live, they're the people that are living among us who have been marginalized, ignored, treated unjustly, or looked down upon. He says these are the immigrants, the refugees, the poor, the ethnic minorities, the people who have been deemed invisible, invisible or surplus population. And he says that we often when we think about missions, we actually just fly over them. And go to another country. He says this, I have been asked many times by people in the margins, why is it that many Christians feel the need to fly across the globe to interact with people, people groups that can be found on the side of the city? Why do we do this? Right? Why do we do this? Why is it that we, we can't see our Samaria? And we have to think by reaching the nations, we think, oh, we got to go. We got to go in Mexico. We got to go to all those countries in the world. 
And he basically says there are three reasons, three things that keeps us from doing it. He says it's our prejudice, it's our privilege, and our preference. All those three things, one of those things, or all of those things, doesn't help us to reach those who are right in front of us. And they are, remember, part of those unreached people here in the United States. 95 of groups that are not, have not been reached with the gospel. And this is happening all throughout the United States. Yet Jesus says, look at the fields. And then he also says this. He says, the harvest is ready. What did he mean by that? What does he mean by it being ready? Well, he says, we are laboring for the fruit, he says, but God has already done the work. He's already prepared them to receive the gospel so that they can believe and they can continue sharing the gospel. He says the fruit is eternal life. The fruit of the harvest is eternal life. And he's saying people are ready to receive eternal life. What we need is the people telling them about Jesus. And here's the, the good news. We don't have to go that far. Remember in Matthew 10, 35, the Lord says, pray. There, we, we need more labors. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more labors. And often we think is we got to send more labors out there. Well, no, we got to pray that God send more labors. But here where we are and close to us, you know, we have more believers alive now than we have ever have. And we still need labors to reach Samaria. And it is for the same reason that the Jews did not want to go to Samaria. Because they had prejudice, they had their privileges, and their preferences. And yet Jesus said, go there, go to Judea, go to Samaria, he said, and then to the ends of the earth. And the early church did it. We know they did. At first they, they didn't catch it. They didn't go. And so the Lord has to send some persecution and people start going all over. And Philip in Samaria, an interesting thing is he stays there for about 20 plus years with his three daughters and sharing the gospel. So they did obey and going to Samaria. And then we have the Apostle Paul that took the gospel beyond Samaria to the ends of the earth. And in fact, he had such an urgency to take this gospel to the ends of the earth, and he did. But now we have this new Samaria all over our country and maybe the world, and we have no urgency to share the gospel. We'd rather have them out of our country, which is not very different than what the Jews wanted. They really wanted the Samaritans not to be there. And so this author, uh, Alejandro Mandes, writes this. Because of the trajectory of this country, talking about our nation, look how it parallels to what we're talking about. Our quickly changing demographics, we don't have a lot of time to ponder the implication of this truth for the evangelical Christian church. There is urgency in this matter. The church has lost its lamp. Many Christian leaders know this is true and have struggled to figure out how to change the course. But spending more money on marketing, fine-tuning our programming, is not going to solve the problem. We have focused too much on ourselves and missed the blessing of the other. This is not about politics, economics, right or wrong. This is reality. The question really is, are we going to be the church that will not fail? That's our new Samaria. You say, okay, I, you, you kind of convinced me, but show me that it's happening around us. I've been in about four states, and all are the same. And the demographics uh, here in, in Washington are very similar as well. And you say, well, in Edmonds, uh, I guess Edmonds probably not that way. Well, Edmonds, yes, it's not as diverse. You have about 74.6 that are, you know, white. And we, we, that's the way demographics shows it. And 9.32% are Asian, and about 6.2% that are Hispanics. You still have some diversity. That's Edmonds, but Edmonds is it, it's a little bit behind the, the statewide demographics, but right next to you is a city called Linwood. <laughs> and you all laugh, it's like, oh yeah, I don't want to go to Linwood. <laughs> 
right? I've only been here uh, five months, so I don't, I don't know everything about uh, Washington, but I know a few things when people tell me Linwood or Everett. I know what they mean. Look, there's a, in Linwood, it's about 20 points. Uh, there's about 53% are white now. But again, that's kind of decreases the overall. And then we have about 70% Asian, and we have 8.51 of black or African American, and we have 13.9% are Hispanics. Is it diverse? Yes. There is diversity in the city of Linwood, which is not too far from you. And looking at the state of Washington, it's the same thing. We really have demographics have been changing a lot in the state of Washington. And in particular, there are three ethnic uh, groups we want or countries represented that make up the majority of the ethnic minorities here in, 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 in Washington. They're from Mexico, they're from India, and from China. And if you think about it, unrich people, guess where they are? They're in India and they're in China. And some parts of Mexico are still not unreached. So we need to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Right? And, I, and I kind of alluded that to the beginning. I think God has sovereignly allowed them to come to this country just like he allowed the Samaritans to be close to the Jews. But he did, has done this for a reason. He wants us to be intentionally sharing the gospel with them. In fact, Alejandro Mande says this, the problem is usually our plans are too small. Not only has Jesus clearly called us to open our eyes and see the harvest, but he also called us to look to where the Father is at work. When was the last time you asked yourself, where is God at work around me? Ooh, good question, right? What if this demographic shift is from God, which is what I was asking? What if this is the Father at work, and what if we should see the movement of people around the world as, as he's doing? If this is the case, then reacting in fear, resisting and trying to limit their growth is actively working against God. Wow. And I would say I agree with this. He says, what if this growth is part of God's plan to reach the world? I believe God is exercising his prerogative to determine a nation's boundaries and the time of their position or privilege in the world. And he goes on and says, I truly believe it is God's design that people from all over the world are living among us. This is the Father at work. Are we ready, as Jesus said, to work where the Father is at work? And that's a question for us. Are we ready to work where God is at work? Just like Jesus sent his disciples, he's also sent us. He's sending us to the nations. But they are here in our country. There are a couple of hours. Well, not even, not even a couple of hours. Probably 20 minutes away from us. Maybe down the block for most of us. We just moved to an area in Marysville, and that's a new development. It's so interesting because it's... It's the way they design it, I guess, is so that it's more diverse. But I have Filipino friends right on my right side, both on my right and left. I have, um, obviously, I have white, I have uh, African Americans. I, and there, there's diversity right there. And you know what? It's pretty exciting. I go, wow, this, this is so cool. My daughter's already friends next door. She'll meet her next week. She's already friends next door with the girl. He taught the little girl how to ride the bicycle. They love her, and we're connecting with them. But many of us have them right in front of us. You know, a, a few weeks ago, I was in our service, which is great. I mean, we got really good, good worship. And it should be a time when we were rejoicing, right, and worshiping God. But for some reason, I felt really uh, sad when we were worshiping. And part of that is like, I was sensing it was, this is great. We have this worship. In fact, here was great too. And we sing about Jesus, right? And we're, we're excited and we feel, man, this is my Savior. But then you think about all those people that don't know Jesus. Yeah, they can't sing that. It almost feels wrong that we feel so good. And yet, this is what we look forward to. In heaven, right? To worship with people from other nations. Just think about it. I often close my eyes and try to visualize what that would be like. 
people that don't look like us, people that don't speak the same language like us. What, what is it going to be like when we're there and we, we're singing people that we've never even known they existed? Well, I think we can begin to do that. If we follow Jesus' mandate to go and, and reach our new Samaria, I think we can. It is so cool. When I think about it, the possibilities of what we can do here is very cool. So we must do something. But I know some people would say, but you know what? I don't think we can do this. Let God do it. Right? I don't understand them. I don't speak their language. I don't like their food. And I'm picky with food. And our attitude is not so different than when the huge missionary movement began with William Carey. If you've ever heard about missions, William Carey is like the father of modern missions. And when God started prompting him to go to India and reach the world, he came to his church, he told the, the, his, the leaders there, and his pastor told him, sit down, young man. If God wants to save the heathen, he will do it himself. That's what he said. But you know, William Carey didn't listen. I'm glad he didn't. He went on to be a missionary in India. And he started the movement that we call the modern missions movement. But if he wasn't because he really believed that God had called us to go, we would not have that. So it is not impossible. Yes, there will be many that say, I don't want to do this. We have them all the time, right? But God can do it through us. You and me, God can use us to reach the nations here in our new Samaria. How do we do this, right? That's the question. How do we do this? We don't really have to, you know, prepare a lot. We don't have to prepare a course for missions. We don't have to kind of do all these things. It's very simple. We have them here where you live, start praying, and you have this in, in your notes, for opportunities in your church, in your neighborhood. Start praying that God would lead you to those people that are close to you that need the gospel. And start working in that. See how God leads you to develop opportunities, friendships, to share with them the gospel. Look around your community. What's happening in your community. And seek opportunities to be involved in your community. To share the gospel. If there's a food bank ministry. Something that's around you. We have a food bank ministry in our church. And I tell you. That's the, the greatest thing I could ever thought of. I have met people from China. From Afghanistan from Ukraine and I pray with them and I've shared the gospel and 70% of them are Hispanic so I'm in a good place there but that's what we got to look for where are them where are they learn pray share with someone from a different culture in fact next week it's a good opportunity to begin right you have a church here of people who are Hispanics and I believe that it's no coincidence that you have them here when we know that the, the, the fastest group in America are Hispanics. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> in fact, it gets, we're populating. And so what a great opportunity to, to next week to be able to share together, live together, start thinking what does God wants us as a church? And you got partners, right, who speak Spanish, and you also are here, and you want to carry out Jesus' mandate to reach all nations. So I, my prayer is that as, as you become more aware of this, you would be more involved in reaching more people with the gospel. The nations that are here in America, I'd be more than happy to, 
to help you as much as I can and encourage you to do that. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you that you gave us your word very clear in your example of going and reaching the people that are right before our eyes that need Jesus. And we are seeing the tremendous opportunity here in the United States. Yes, it's upheaval in, in this world. Yes, there's all kinds of things that we see evil happening. But the only hope that we have is the gospel. And you desire people to know you. You desire people to come to, to know you. And you have given us this task of taking the gospel to those who have yet to hear anything, anything about you. Just the name of Jesus. And we hear often stories of people having visions about Jesus. Why do we need visions when we have people to go? We should be going. They shouldn't be having those visions because no one goes. And we have them right next door. We have them around our community. And they want to be part of this culture. And they don't know you. And so I just pray that you would help us here as a church. As Edge would be, uh, come, becomes more aware of its surroundings here. The people that are, are gathered here every Sunday. I pray that you would instill them the, the, the passion for reaching those around them, regardless of where they're from, the language, the culture, the politics, because ultimately that really is not the most important thing, but it's for them to know you. And so I just pray that as you continue to lead this church, you will lead it to those that are right in front, the new Samaria, to reach to them with the gospel. And we're all in this, whether we are a church here or even in Bothell or the areas surrounding us, our calling is the same. And as, as a church, as the church, we commit to being faithful and obedient to you. Show us what we need to do to carry out your mandate. Because until then, our task is not done. It doesn't matter how old we are, how young we are. Our task is not done until, until this is accomplished. So we thank you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, Edgar. Thank you. I want to talk to you a little bit about next week because it's really important. It's the springboard of what Ed, Edgar shared, but we are having the combined service, okay, with the Hispanic congregation and our congregation. We're one church. And this is uh, really a special Sunday. It's an important Sunday. It's really important that you come and you be here. And um, Edgar's going to be sharing his testimony next week. Uh, Julio, Pastor Julio will be um, doing a short message. Um, Edgar will be translating for Julio. So a lot of it will be in Spanish, but uh, we will be having a combined uh, worship team doing a couple songs of the worship team with Hispanics and our worship and the English worship team. And uh, then we're going to have a combined potluck afterwards. So it's just going to be, the service will be about an hour, then we're going to go down to the gym. So um, just want to encourage you. I mean, you can invite somebody or whatever. Just, just this was a great, uh, I mean, challenging message today. So uh, we are meeting at 11 o'clock next week. So uh, in this time change, you're already going to get an extra hour of sleep. So, so then you'll get an extra 15 minutes too. So, um, so and, and the Spanish congregation is going to start their service uh, so at 11 with us. So it's all going to be combined. So I can't wait. I can't wait uh, to worship together next week. And, um, and I can't wait to taste all your food. So uh, I'm gonna, we're going to do, uh, in closing, um, this morning, the song that we've been learning that I wrote years ago uh, for a conference with crew, um, Heart for the World, a stand. Give me a heart for the world. I think you probably know it now. Give me a heart for the world. Give me a heart for the world. They need to know that you love them so. Lord, give me a heart for the world. The 
Let's go to the bridge. They need to know. Edgar will be up here if you want to come and greet him and talk to him. You are dismissed. <laughs>